October 1952, political unrest, already smouldering in the British East African colony of Kenya, suddenly burst into flesh to herald a period of violence unsurpassed in British colonial history. At the same time, a new word was born, Mau Mau, to strike terror into the heart of the whole colony. At the time, the alleged leader of the movement was a pre-war minor African politician named Jomo Kenyatta. His tribe, the Kikuyu, was one of the most influential among Kenya's 52 tribes, and for a long time they nursed a grievance over land reform. Despite deep-rooted suspicions that Kenyatta was the moving force behind Mau Mau, he gave it no verbal support during detention, and after his release, proclaimed that terrorism would only retard independence. His actual words were, whoever supports trouble or violence is an enemy of our freedom. Nevertheless, thousands of Kikuyu tribesmen were enlisted, often by fear and intimidation, into Mau Mau with its hideous initiation ceremony. By the end of hostilities, four years later, 20,000 Africans had died, many of whom were Kikuyu who refused to join Mau Mau. Some were devout Christians and kept to their beliefs, often under terrible persecution. 30 Asians and over a hundred British soldiers and settlers were killed, and this Church of the Martyrs at Fort Hall was built on the site of some of the most horrifying of the Mau Mau atrocities. Kenya, however, was quick to rise from the ashes of destruction and immediately set about the business of social and economic recovery. The country was to begin a new experiment in multiracial cooperation. Much of Kenya's fertile land lies in the Kikuyu areas. Before the emergency, the Kikuyu lived in homesteads all over the countryside, each farmer owning a number of small scattered plots, which made planned farming impossible. During the emergency, the Kikuyu were concentrated into villages as a protection against Mau Mau, and quickly recognized the advantages of this organization. It later paved the way for land consolidation, which gave every farmer his right amount of land and in one piece. This Kikuyu farmer once had five sections of land several miles apart. He now has a 22-acre farm employing four permanent laborers and several casual workers. His cattle and livestock are all high grade and his crops provide him with a comfortable income, enough to build a new house away from the village. Land consolidation is complete in many areas, but the village system has now caught on and has become the centre of rural social services with schools, clinics, churches and shopping centres. The Kikuyu, panga in hand, now harvests his crops, where a few years ago he was probably using the knife for violent purposes. Government training schools teach modern methods of farming. Government and voluntary organizations teach the women folk the basic principles of family welfare. At this centre, they are given instruction in child welfare, hygiene and first aid. Then they return to their village to organise classes among the other women. School is now an everyday part of many Kikuyu children's lives. Thousands of former terrorists were reinstated into tribal society after their release from prison. Many of them were detained in Hola camp on the banks of Kenya's largest river, the Tana. Hola stands in the heart of a vast uninhabited area of dry scrub between the centre of Kenya and its eastern coast. But a huge irrigation system is rapidly changing the scene into a patchwork of green vegetation. Hola 
a name synonymous with barbed wire and detention and even death, has been planned to become one of Kenya's new agricultural areas. It is hoped that the new Hola will soon become a fully productive area of 100,000 acres, irrigated by the river Tana, to bring further agricultural prosperity to Kenya and living space to some of its landless. Many of Kenya's landless Kikuyus work on European farms. 1,000 work on this sisal farm of 14,000 acres. Many of these men are ex mama initiates. Among them are several known murderers. They are given instruction in sisal growing in the field, and some have a small plot where they grow their own crops. For sisal, Kenya's third biggest export is at a premium. The sisal plant lives from seven to ten years, when it goes to seed and reproduces itself. Much research has gone into the industry with promising results. Sisal contains hycogenine, one of the best raw materials from which the drug cortisone can be made. Other potential byproducts are wax and methane gas. And the sisal fiber itself is being used in carpet making and upholstery. The fiber comes from the thick green leaves which are processed on the farm. The leaves are crushed by rollers, leaving the white fibers to be hung up and dry. Then they are made up into the familiar rope and twine seen all over the world. The largest of Kenya's exports is coffee. A quarter of its annual production is grown and processed by Africans with government help. They are also instructed in crop production, proper pruning and the use of insecticides. A number of African girls have now been appointed to the coffee board of Kenya and the coffee marketing board. Coffee growing areas among the various tribes have increased from 800 acres in 1946 to the present figure of 63,000 acres, and African growers now produce one-third of the country's total crop. When ripe, the coffee berry, or cherry as it's called, is picked by experts who can harvest 200 weight a day. Nearly all African growers farm under a cooperative system, and all their crops are processed and graded at a collective depot in each district. From the farms, the cherries go to a cooperative processing plant to be washed and put through a plant which strips off the flesh of the fruit, leaving the stone or bean to be dried and processed for shipment all over the world. Coffee represents over 40% of Kenya's exportable commodities and is worth 10 million pounds annually. West of the Kikuyu areas is a range of hills known as the Aberdeer. It was to these thickly wooded slopes that the terrorists retreated, and where finally many of them were wiped out by British and African troops. The road across the Aberdares was hacked out by army bulldozers during the emergency, and it now leads to the vast Rift Valley and the European farming area. Kenya's economy is largely based upon the produce of European-owned farms and until the latter part of the last century, these lands were unoccupied. The African discarded them as infertile, but the Europeans introduced new farming methods, and although much of the land is inferior to that of African farms, far greater yields are obtained from it. European farms cover less than a quarter of the African area, yet their annual production is four times that of the African. One of the main crops is pyrethrum, a daisy-like flower which yields an extract fatal to almost every known insect. Kenya, which is the world's biggest producer of this deadly insecticide, owes its present one million pounds industry to an English settler who carried out long and patient experiments in the 1920s. But growing of the plant is not easy. It only grows economically at certain altitudes, and there is also a critical picking period. This work is mostly done by African women and children. European farmers enjoy a comfortable standard of living. Many have a large acreage. But grazing in some cases is so poor that the number
number of cattle per acre is much lower than in many countries. Some have built luxurious homes for themselves and for the generations they hope will follow. But many of these farms were only made possible by the sweat and toil of the early settlers who pioneered the land. Today, the born and bred Kenyan feels that Kenya is his birthright as much as the African. Plans to open up the closed European farming areas to Africans met with violent disapproval in many instances. Even so, many Europeans believe that the only answer lies in multiracial coexistence. Of all African countries, Kenya is perhaps the most complex racially. There are 8 million Africans, 63,000 Europeans, 182,000 Asians, 40,000 Arabs, and several thousand mixed races. They all have their own practices and customs, which are an accepted part of Kenya and its way of life. In Nairobi, the capital, color and racial bars have disappeared. Africans eat and drink side by side with Europeans in the same restaurants and coffee bars that mirror the cosmopolitan atmosphere of the city. The only condition of entry is that the customer is properly dressed, and this includes Europeans. Arab mosques lend a mystic eastern atmosphere to the crowded streets, and just a short distance away, the scene is transformed by the unmistakable atmosphere of the Indian quarter. The Indian population of Kenya, although minute in comparison, is nonetheless second to the African population. Many of them live in Nairobi. Some are merchant families of several generations standing, and they strongly influence Kenya's social and economic affairs. The Indians have all guarded as the artisans of Kenya. Their predecessors arrived in Nairobi with the railway in 1899, and today many of them form the main labor force of the East African Railway, which operates throughout Kenya and the surrounding countries. With rapid development of the East African countries, there has been a corresponding growth in the railway, calling for more trained staff, many of whom are recruited locally. This has meant increased training facilities, and today a new school in Nairobi is training apprentices of all races, the greater majority of whom are African. The apprentices, all housed and fed at the training center, are given tuition in all branches of railway administration, operation, commerce, heavy engineering, mechanical engineering, and signaling. Most of the Arabs in Kenya populate the eastern coastal areas. Nearly 20,000 live in and around the ancient port of Mombasa. Fort Jesus, Kenya's oldest building, overlooks a scene that has changed little since 1593, when it was built by the Portuguese to foil Arab slave traders. Over 200 years of bloody fighting between the two races finally came to an end in 1823, when the British flag was hoisted at the request of an Arab sheikh to protect him from rival forces. Today, ships of the tiny Royal East African Navy patrol the harbor and surrounding waters, showing the flag to merchant ships of all nations that line Mombasa's busy wharves. Arab influence is particularly strong in the narrow, twisting alleyways of Mombasa's dockside areas and little change has come to these streets, where African slaves were once dragged to waiting ships. Today, many older Arabs still retain their strict customs and traditions, and women under Perda still cover themselves from head to foot in their traditional long black veils. But the younger generations are breaking away, and many of them attend government schools to train as teachers, midwives, and nurses. Education among Arab boys has long been established. As long ago as 1908, the British government made money available as compensation for the freeing of slaves. The Arabs asked that this should be used to build a school. In this Arab secondary school, which is part of the Mombasa Institute of Muslim Education, the staff are interracial under a British headmaster. Pupils are drawn from all over Kenya and are educated in the Muslim belief. In 
contrast are the great Maasai, who once dominated much of East Africa. Adherence to their own primitive way of life has until recently defied all efforts to rehabilitate them. And despite the great wealth which they possess in their cattle herds, losses from tsetse fly and other pests are enormous. Only through patient propaganda and education are the Maasai beginning to adopt new methods, such as bush clearance and dipping tanks to help rid them of the tsetse fly, and irrigation schemes and land development to give them more grazing areas. But old habits die hard, and social advancement is a constant battle. Some Maasai children attend government schools, but many tribes still practice primitive customs. And despite their proud traditions, they still live in the utmost squalor, existing mainly on blood and milk obtained from their cattle. But even the primitive aspects of Kenya are slowly disappearing. Modern hospitals like Nairobi's King George VI Hospital now train African nurses up to British-recognized state registry, and locally trained doctors have at their disposal the finest equipment available for their practices. In modern laboratories, research is helping to evolve new techniques to fight the numerous diseases which ravage many parts of the country. This, then, is the theme of Kenya, the moulding of the old into the new. But much of the old still exists, and for many, Kenya will always be the land of safari and big game hunting. There can be few countries to rival its diversity of scenery and people, and today, more than ever, Tourist attractions play a great part in the country's economy. National parks, with an abundance of wildlife in its natural state, attract visitors from all over the world. And strict game laws now preserve the wildlife of Kenya in areas that shelter a greater variety of species than any other country. The first elections for the new central parliament and regional assemblies were held in May 1963. Jomo Kenyatta, leader of the Kenya African National Union, won a convincing victory in the House of Representatives and was invited by the governor to become Kenya's first prime minister. Independence came on the 12th of December, 1963. No one will dispute that the rapid growth of Kenya has been due to European influence, and to dispense with that influence now would be suicidal. Many Europeans have a sincere faith in a multiracial society. Whether or not that faith is justified remains to be seen. 